goes live until six. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah. we're doing yeah. it. Presumably he'll confirm. Yeah, I don't think yeah, he should be using a thumbs up there. It's not on it. So. Just make sure that doesn't uh, die on me. Oh, yeah. Right, welcome everybody at six o'clock, uh, and uh, welcome to uh, everybody who's watching online. Um, tonight um, we're going to have a, a presentation from uh, Dr. Chris uh, Menkiti from uh, GCG, who's going to be talking to us about tunneling ground risks. And we'll have the presentation, and then we have an opportunity for questions um, afterwards. Um, for our um, watchers online, what we're going to try is a small experiment this evening, that uh, if you wish to answer a, ask a question while you're online, we're going to use a Twitter hashtag feed. So if you'd like to ask a question, or indeed if you're shy in the audience, you're very welcome to use that as well. And we're going to use the hashtag um, tunnel risk. So tunnel risk is one word. So if you'd like to tweet or ask um, a question as the presentation is going on, and I'll check my phone at the end, and then we can ask Chris any questions that are coming from our um, online audience. And uh, just to say to the members in the room, we tend to have a, a much larger online audience these days than we actually do sitting in the room. So you are not alone. There's probably 40 or 60 people out there, as we understand, having pizza parties and uh, after, <laughs> after work sessions uh, watching in. So, um, and uh, um, giving them the opportunity this time to ask any questions. So if I hand over to Chris now, I can give his uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Chris Mankiti. I'm a senior partner at GCG. And tonight I'd like to talk to you about tunneling ground risks, um, giving you um, a slight slant towards the client's perspective. <clears throat> this is a repeat of a talk that I gave uh, in January to the Southeast group. Um, someone must have enjoyed it, but they asked if I can repeat it today. Uh, and since then I have refined it a little bit to make it a bit different. I'll start the talk off by discussing, um, uh, ex examining what are ground risks in tunneling and then how they can be addressed. I'll try to illustrate the points I make with case histories. And I'll have two examples where the risks were well managed and two examples where the problems were uh, more substantial. Um, and then I'll try and draw conclusions at the end and lessons learned which I'll try to bring out through various stages of the talk. So starting with some basic definitions, um, hazards are events with the potential to cause harm, for example, a tunnel collapse. And the hazard will typically have um, various consequences, um, each with different likelihoods of occurrence. The risk is the combination of the consequence or severity of the hazard and the likelihood to occur. So if you like, the risk is in, measured in pounds, the consequences, for example, measured in pounds or in lives or in injury weeks times the probability of occurrence. So what are ground risks uh, due to tunneling? Well, there are some well-established processes that can be followed. 
um, uh, to identify and detail ground risks. And one of the key uh, references is the Joint Code of Practice uh, prepared by the British Tunneling Society in association with the Association of British, of, uh, British Insurers. Uh, this was developed after a spate of tunnel collapses in the 90s when the insurance industry was about to pull out from tunneling, considering it to be too risky and uninsurable. Um, so um, the BTS uh, representing the tunnel fraternity and the insurance industry sat down together and uh, codified a systematic approach for dealing with risk, which meant that they could continue their involvement and projects could continue. So what are ground risks due to tunneling? I'll try to illustrate this using Crossrail as an example. Um, and so for Crossrail, uh, high-level ground risks were identified by the project insurers, and this included collapse of the tunnels and under underground works, inundation of shafts and tunnels, failure of SCL ton uh, structures, and loss of or damage of the TBM underground, and of course, catastrophic um, third-party losses. More specifically, uh, looking at uh, risks associated with the ground and various components of the ground, they identified London clay and settlements uh, therein due to the tunneling, Lambert Group, and of course, the broad range of uh, variations and, and materials that are encompassed in, in, in that group, fault zones where you could have instabilities and uh, rapidly changing ground conditions and groundwater conditions indeed. Um, inundation of the tunnels in Ethernet Sands, they were particularly worried about that. Um, they were also concerned about some of the consequences of widespread groundwater um, control. The river crossings were an area they thought was of particular um, uh, risk. And Canary Wharf Station uh, beneath West India Dock, you know, constructing beneath the dock, and also with the high value uh, properties around. So given th that broad introduction, um, how can ground risks related to tunneling be addressed? Uh, the uh, code of practice, the joint code of practice identifies a, a clear process and it begins with a formal identification of hazards and quantification of the risks using risk assessments. So really this is a requirement of the, of the uh, code of practice and quite often project insurances will not be applicable if, if these if this steps are not followed. Um, there's a need also for formalized documentation of risk management procedures, um, identification of responsibilities, um, and prov provision of uh, adequate resources and finance. Um, risk registers have to be kept and they have to be continuously updated. There's a need to reduce risks to as low as reasonably practicable levels uh, by taking proactive actions, first to eliminate all risks that can be eliminated, then to mitigate those that cannot be um, eliminated, and then to transfer what is left on to down the chain, but making sure that you communicate clearly what risks are being transferred and what risks are being taken on, and then having a system to manage the residual risks and have contingencies. So risk management, as required by this code of practice, has to be project specific. Um, and it has to apply from development right through to construction. It can't be bolted on during construction uh, at a late stage. It has to be throughout the whole life of the project, really. So with that background, the client's role is quite important. You know, the client has to be competent and knowledgeable, or else get specialists to help them um, carry out their roles. Um, the client is responsible for the works information issued to tenderers and how well that communicates ground conditions and, and risks um, is clearly a factor. The client or his, or his representative um, have to ensure that adequate time and resources are available for evaluating and uh, addressing these risks. Um, and of course, the contractual relationships that are set up are very important and how they distribute and communicate risk. Um, it's important for successful outcomes. And clearly, throughout all this, a good ground investigation and a good ground model um, is highlighted as a key component of managing uh, those, those tunnel, tunneling related risks. So, to, to, 
To summarize, um, we need very project-specific approach, um, sort of broad generic approaches really won't do. Um, you need to focus on the details of the particular project. You need to be exhaustive in identifying risks, and this is quite important. Um, some risks can be subtle or unknown, or can be complex interactions of various factors, which are each <coughs> on their own are not necessarily significant. Um, and quite often, problems occur with unidentified risks, which is why it's so important to be exhaustive, and which is why experience is so useful. So in terms of existing best practice guide, we've talked about the joint code of practice. There's also British standards for health and safety in tunneling, there's CDM regulations, and there are also other documents, but these all broadly follow the, the, uh, the process and scheme I've just discussed. I'd like to give some examples of specific tunneling risks now, just to illustrate uh, typical examples. So with TBM, for example, um, there are potential risks from a fault zone, uh, loose high water bearing uh, zones in front of the face, or failure of the tail skin ceiling, or failure of the tail skin itself, or collapse of the segmental uh, ring. So here you see an example, you know, schematically showing uh, how a tunnel, the TVM can be inundated by hitting a water bearing or unexpected, I imagine, water bearing zone ahead of the face. Or here showing examples of leakage from the tail skin area. Uh, and you can imagine how risky this could be if inflow is quite sudden and uncontrolled. Quite often you construct the uh, tunnels with a machine successfully and then when you come to do the cross passage near the end of the project, you then encounter difficult ground between the tunnels which the TBMs had successfully uh, negotiated through. So it's often necessary perhaps to do some ground treatment um, to, and to have uh, measures to isolate and seal um, against uh, ingress from cross passage construction. Uh, we've discussed how complex and variable ground conditions could be problematic. These are some examples from Farringdon and Crossroad Project showing faulting and layering uh, in, in the Farringdon area and how ground conditions can change very quickly over short distances um, and introduce various uh, hazards and consequences. So, so far we've looked at uh, natural hazards, but of course man-made hazards are also another complete class on their own. And so for tunneling in an urban environment, um, you know, we can expect, uh, for example, this example in Tottenham Court Road with a forest of piles which new construction has to negotiate. And these days, as we have more and more tunneling, intercepting existing piles um, uh, remains an issue. Um, and uh, such piles, of course, are a hazard both to the tunnels and to the third party structures above which they are supporting. Um, construction, the watering risk is another, um, is another uh, strand of risk that often have to be considered. So just examining those in some detail, you may have insufficient or ineffective dewatering with a risk of flooding or instability. There could be adverse impact on third party abstractors who could be influenced by dewatering activities. There could be dewatering induced settlements, but usually these are, these are not significant unless you have mixed foundations because the settlement, the, the drawdown cone and the settlement cone is often quite gentle and broad. But you can have problems with mixed foundations or where you have soft soils and the dewatering causes significant changes in effective stress which can lead to large settlements. Um, there's of course the um, aspect of transmitting and spreading uh, contamination or selling water or, or other aspects related to dewatering. So, look, so those are the typical risks which are often, uh, uh, often identified, but uh, some additional risks which are not so obvious, um, for example, entrapment of gas in uh, aquifers subject to dewatering, or the potential impact of uh, drawdown cones intercepting drift field hollows at distances significantly away from the area of construction and dewatering. So just looking at some mechanisms of air entry and um, and I know this has been subject of other talks in some detail. So here you're looking at, for example, in, in the Crossrail London example, 
Uh, you draw down water uh, in a chalk well, usually cased through the, over, of the overburdening soils into rockhead. That process draws in air, and on recovery, the air can get trapped uh, in the ground. Um, sources are often chalk wells or abandoned wells or boreholes or even piezometers with tubings that open to the atmosphere where as you draw down the water level, air can be uh, sucked in. So in this example, uh, showing a Canary Wharf station of cross rail um, with the geological profile of river terrace deposits over London clay with the Lambert group in brown, planet sands and chalk uh, beneath that. Um, the initial water level is shown with that line and I hope you can see. Uh, the mouse is not showing on the screen. But initial water level is upper pale blue line which was then drawn down uh, with the watering works uh, to the uh, dotted blue line within the chalk. And air could then get trapped above the upnor formation, uh, for example, which on recovery of the groundwater gets compressed, um, um, applying higher pressures uh, onto the over onto the uh, soil layers above that. But of course, the solution is simple. If the risk is understood and identified, you can phase your dewatering turn off gradually so that the air is pushed out in a continuous front. You can have some uh, wells and piezometers left available to vent uh, the bubble. Um, so the solution is that it's one of these risks that if it's not identified, it can be problematic. But if it's known, um, measures can be taken to deal with, to deal with it. This just shows the typical drawdown cone from a cross rail at the peak of the dewatering where you know, you're know you talking about a drawdown cone of several kilometers in diameter. Again, showing why uh, the potential impact is, is widespread. Of course, the aim of all this is to avoid uh, collapses. And I've shown here four um, notable ones, uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil, Gerald's Cross in the UK, Singapore, uh, MRT collapse and the Dubai Infinity Tower. And this is still occurring even last month, 12th of August, uh, a collapse in a shallow TBM tunnel occurred in Germany, um, blocking trains linking Germany to Switzerland. And this is poor reported in Tunnel 12. So if we just look at the, UK, the last notable four UK cases, and this is post uh, Heathrow collapse. So we have the DR, DLR in 98. Humber Care, Siwa in 1999, Gerald's Cross in 2005, and Glendale in Scotland. <coughs> you may well argue that the next one may be um, overdue. So really, the processes we have discussed should not be an automatic process. They really should be followed through with enthusiasm each time. And of course, talking about UK experience, this is not new. This is uh, photograph, I think it's, it's, I think it's a, a sketch of the Metropolitan Line during construction where they also had similar problems. So I'm going to try to illustrate some of these uh, aspects using case histories. Um, I will use um, a case histories of examples from around the world, um, Dublin and London, where um, um, risks were well managed and some examples that were more problematic from Warsaw and uh, Istanbul. So the first example is cross rail, which we've talked about a little bit. I won't dwell on this, but essentially 21 kilometers of steam board tunnels on the ground with several uh, underground stations. Uh, the main challenges were controlled ground movements and groundwater during construction, uh, particularly for large span sprayed concrete caverns, uh, for the tunnels, for the cross passages and the shafts. Um, there's a lot of very variable ground and faulted ground conditions, some of the pictures we've seen. There was a need to mitigate impact on third party structures, particularly due to settlement from the tunneling. Um, there was risk, risk of buried obstructions, some of which you've looked at. And to give you an idea of the size of the impact, about 12,500 properties had to be surveyed beforehand to get um, baseline information. So the key approach, uh, the, the, the key type color, uh, the key approach used by Crossrail involved. Um, High quality ground model. Um, uh, the the cross rail process used a very 
uh, detailed um, and high quality ground investigation. A centrally produced interpretative report was, uh, was uh, uh, produced, pulling this all together. Um, and uh, the well-defined model then led to significant cost savings and, and program savings down the line uh, during construction. Um, and also uh, the detailed model allowed uh, reduction in tunnel risks. Um, another key um, uh, strand to the, the cross-rail approach was to have a very, very tight TBM specification. So um, air pressure balance and slurry TBMs were specified, uh, drawing on the experience, the very good experience from the CTRL project uh, before. Um, and really, the owner took an uncompromising approach to specification of the TBM uh, with respect to risk management. Um, and essentially, the TBMs were the primary tool to uh, manage the impact of ground movements on third parties. And with the high-spec TBMs used and um, Mitigation of impact for the running tunnels really wasn't necessary, and effort could be concentrated at the stations. So this shows a picture of uh, typical TBM. Um, closed TBMs were used. They were designed to work 100% uh, closed mode, and they were developed to cover the varying ground conditions that were expected, drawing on the detailed uh, ground model that was available. Um, EPV machines were used for all the drives, except the river crossing and the chalk where a slurry machine was used. And I think, as I indicated, this was all based on the very good performance with TBMs uh, from the previous project, CTRL. Uh, ground movements was a key a risk for that project. And uh, the TBM specification uh, was one aspect of dealing with that. Essentially, uh, contractors had to deal with a maximum volume loss of 1%. And in key locations, that was tighter. And compensation grouting was used to address uh, uh, residual ground movements, having achieved, you know, uh, good TBM operation and uh, control volume loss. So just quickly, uh, defining compensation grouting, uh, probably quite a lot of you are familiar with it. But the principle is that you're planning to build a tunnel underneath an existing structure which will cause unacceptable movements, indicated by the red dotted line. So to overcome this, you introduce grouting, a grouting horizon between the tunnel and the structure, where you introduce and in, you inject grout during tunnel construction. Quite often, you do, the, you do this using terms from a shaft or surface excavation. But the idea is that as you construct the tunnel and settlement is being induced, you grout, and the grout induces heave, which cancels out the settlement. So the, the idea is to grout simultaneously with tunneling so that the building never experiences the large and intolerable settlements. It's not suitable to allow the building to settle and then jack it up because, of course, you damage the building and repeated cycles of, of uh, settlement and heave may also be further uh, even more damaging. So this just shows an extent of the tibia, of the uh, tuba mochettes, the grouting tubes uh, in, in Provide progress in cross rail, and this example is for Bond Street Station. Some 16 and a half kilometers of tuba mochettes were drilled to cover the treatment area, and this illustrates some of the problems and risks in, uh, in, in dealt with. In some areas, you have to uh, compensate for settlement. In other areas, buildings are piled, and you have to uh, work around them. So the the compensation grouting approach used. Um, was a development of uh, the system used in the Jubilee Line Tunnel and in earlier, in earlier projects. So uh, the idea is that very large settlements would occur, such as that profile shown, if nothing was done, despite using a high performance TBM and despite meeting the volume loss of 1% that was specified. And these sort of settlements could be in the stations 200, 300 millimeters peak. So the idea is to grout to reduce that, but this time targeting the differential movements. So you flatten out that settlement profile. You may still have significant settlements up to 100 millimeters or more in areas, but the profile is very gentle and it's not damaging for the buildings. Whereas in previous projects like the Jubilee Line extension, um, at that stage to get the process through, the project committed to limiting the settlements to around 25 mil. 
So even though you flattened the project, there were several episodes of heaving the whole area back to contract requirements, uh, which was really not necessary. Of course, with all these uh, aspects, closed monitoring is an, is, uh, is a, an arrow in, in, the, uh, in the quiver for dealing with uh, these sort of risks. And just to illustrate the magnitude involved in crossroad projects, some um, 4,000 odd buildings were involved, affected by the project uh, directly, with more than 50 LU tunnels and more than five uh, network rail surface structures and, over, and thousands of utilities. Of course, with monitoring, you draw whatever um, uh, advantage you can from latest technology and cross rail used um, in-cell monitoring, which is uh, infrared uh, synthetic aquifer, synthetic aperture radar uh, monitoring to try to look at settlements. Um, and this is based on satellite monitoring of, of the ground and between passes, um, you can identify the movement of structures on the ground which reflect back radar that is radar that is incident to the ground from the satellite. So this shows typical results um, around uh, Canary Wharf area, Limo here, the cross hill alignment, tunnel alignment you can see in the center of the green portion at the dark red uh, line showing the alignment of the tunnels. And uh, on the eastern part you can see increased settlement around the area related to the watering in the Limo area. The dotted line I've shown there is location of a fault in, in that area. Now, the fault was known to exist uh, across the cross alignment. It had a small through of about a meter. But we know that it, it affected the groundwater regime in the deep aquifer because it had a completely different regime on the east uh, to that in the west. And if you were pumping and drawing down in the west, you wouldn't affect at all significantly the groundwater um, conditions in the east. And this sort of information is now allowing us to define more accurately the alignment of such faults. Again, to illustrate some of the benefits obtained from monitoring in cross-rail, uh, this shows the results of some fiber optics monitoring by Cambridge University. And these results are for Stepney Green, uh, Stepney Green uh, box, where the diaphragm wall panels were instrumented with fiber optics. So the fiber optics are fiber cables that are embedded in the, in the retaining walls, um, strung along the reinforcement. And essentially, they act as continuous strain gauges, which allow you, uh, by shining a laser through them, uh, or shining light through them, to infer the strain distribution all the way through. Um, I guess there isn't time to go into the details in this uh, talk, but. This just shows you envelopes of the predicted bending moments from the design of, of that panel. And the jagged line shows you the measured envelope of uh, back calculated bending moments from the monitoring during the construction of the wall from the fiber optic in instrument. And you can see that, bending, that steel reinforcement provided based on the peak bending moments would be much higher than actually the loading induced on the wall. And so this sort of information will then allow more efficient and more refined designs for future projects. Moving on to third party assets, of course, close monitoring was required both to verify the design and to satisfy the asset owners that their, their uh, assets were not adversely impacted. And a list of third parties uh, had, to be, um, um, had to be interfaced with by Crossrail. I think I've indicated that the TBM was one of the key um, settlement controlling measures. And this just shows you the detailed monitoring available of the TBM, which allowed its efficient operation to um, show and assist the contractor with achieving the sort of volume loss limits that the contract required. So uh, with the high specification presented, it was possible to monitor the face pressure, the tail skin grouting, and the tunnel alignment, the conveyor belt operation, the ground movements, and to bring all this together in the control room so that a reasonable picture is obtained in real time. Of course, another strand uh, available used in Crossrail was uh, use of improved procurement tools. And so early contractor involvement was, uh, 
was used to allow the contractor to review and comment on the design and allow um, opportunities for um, improvements before construction actually started. There was also the use, use of baseline reports, or GBRs, to define the contractual uh, limit of risk that the client is willing to accept. I won't dwell on baseline reporting significantly here, but just to highlight the key characteristics. Uh, for the cross rail, it was a target price contract, not a lump sum. So there isn't, over, uh, there isn't uh, excessive pressure on the contractor to fit into a lump sum. Um, there was a clear allocation of risk. So the, um, it was, it's a commercial document, not technical. This is often misunderstood. People think that the baseline report is the interpretative report. It is not. Essentially, it defines the level of risk that the owner is, is ready to accept, and it tells the contractor the risk level that he must price for. So if you take, for example, the occurrence of um, flints in chalk ahead of a TBM, which can damage the TBM, you may have a certain percentage, a certain frequency of occurrence, say 10 per 100 meters, as the mean in the stretch. But because the impact on the TBM could be very significant, the, the, the owner could decide to ask the uh, contractor to price for a higher frequency of occurrence, 12 or 15 per meter. The contractor then prices for this, which means that if, in reality, um, the uh, frequency of occurrence is more than the TBM, more than the GBR, and it affects the work, then the contractor will get compensated. If the frequency is less than that threshold, is 10, for example, or 12, then it's within the contractor's price. So it, it does not reflect the ground conditions. It reflects the level of risk the owner is ready to accept. And of course, having a well-developed um, ground model allows Crossrail as a client to be able to understand the ground conditions and to set the level of risks that they, were, that they wanted to accept uh, in a very informed way. And today, the GBS have performed very well. And there are various studies to document how well it's performed compared with other projects. I'll now move to the next example of a successful application. And this is uh, from Dublin Port Tunnel in Ireland, one of the projects I worked on some time back. <coughs> it's a design and build, it was a design and build project with self-certification, where about five and a half kilometers of cut and cover and board tunnels, uh, cut and cover work with board tunnels and surface works were required in central Dublin. The employer was the city and uh, the, uh, the contractor and designers are, are listed in the slide. So the area of interest is really the cut and cover section. And um, there was a need to construct a cut and cover uh, section of the tunnel over the existing main road, the M1, leading to the airport, which carried about 4,000 vehicles a day. So to minimize disruption, the contract had been written so that there were huge punitive penalties for uh, renting the lanes during construction to encourage the contractor to complete quickly and, and reinstate the, the major motorway. At the same time, the contractor wanted a very lean design for the cut and cover. He, want, he, he wanted to use the minimum site support necessary. <coughs> both to save money in not installing what is not needed and to be able to reinstate quickly and uh, reinstate uh, the major motorway. It was a design and build contract with self-certification, which means, of course, the, the contractor could push the envelope of design but was also responsible for any consequences. So this shows uh, the footprint of the motorway leading to uh, the airport and the tunnel had to be dug over that footprint. Um, this um, little excavation to the side is of interest. It's a trial, which I'll come to later in my discussions. So the contractor wanted to produce the deep cuts for the motorway, and this shows the work in progress with minimum support for the side slopes. He wanted the side slopes to be unsupported if possible. Um, the excavation was up to 12 meters high, and there was a 12 meter boundary between the edge of the slope and the motorway, which as you can see is here carrying uh, live traffic. So the very tight land take um, was a key characteristic of this. There was also a very short design life. Uh, four months 
or to six months was required to dig down, build the tunnel and backfill. And the contractor wanted a slope that would stand for four months. He didn't want one that would stand for one year or two years, just the minimum. Of course, there were cost and program constraints. And as you can see, very severe consequences of failure where you could take out a lane with traffic. So the ground conditions were Dublin Boulder Clay, which is a lodgment till placed at the bottom of uh, glaciers thought to be more than one kilometer thick. It's very, generally a very competent, dense uh, boulder clay uh, with occasional sand lenses and sand zones. So mitigation measures that we took, uh, and I will explain the engineering solution in a little while, were very detailed logging of all the ex exposures so that the ground conditions were very well understood underneath each section of uh, slope. Um, the design uh, was based on a full-scale trial. The trial then allowed um, calibration of finer element models, and the solution that was implemented was to use a soil nail slope. But the soil nails will not be installed unless absolutely necessary. So it will be essentially freestanding or partly freestanding with the soil nails installed to support it. Um, and the slopes were designed to have a limited design life of, of uh, a few months, as discussed. Of course, with the observational, uh, the nails will be installed ob observationally. And with that observational approach, um, monitoring the geology and monitoring the behavior of slopes was a key part of, of controlling those risks. So this illustrates the design methodology. And here I'm showing uh, the results of the trial slope, which was cut um, just next to the uh, footprint of the motorway. So um, the, the slope was uh, constructed with surcharge placed at the top to, to model traffic loading. And it was monitored for a period of a few months. Um, some of the sand lenses were found to be intermittent, but to provide a continuous drainage horizon around mid-slope. And within a, a, a few months, about two months of slope, the slope failed, uh, similar to the final element prediction. Uh, shown here. So by using this uh, trial, we were able to calibrate final element analysis and then use the calibrated analysis to reproduce the expected behavior for the main excavation, which would have a limited time, time uh, life. So this shows the design. This is cut with the diverted motorway at the top, the hoarding and the side boundary, and we have seen a photograph illustrating it. The excavation will be constructed in lifts the first two lifts will be nailed to protect the road, but the lower lifts will not be nailed. Um, and nails will only be installed if there was adverse movement or adverse ground conditions. And if there weren't, and the behavior was as expected, it will only be partly nailed. Now, this uh, arrangement is a slope of a limited uh, lifespan. And this shows uh, the analysis that we carried out. The construction of the excavation unloads the ground and induces suctions, and those suctions keep the slope standing in the short term. But the suctions are killed off by water brought in from permeable zones, and in this case, a mid-height zone, for example, has killed off a big chunk. So in that sort of area, we'll have to nail the third lift just to keep uh, that stable for the required period of time. So the mechanism is that the slope will stand up for a while with time the zone below the nail softens and uh, deforms, and the whole slope fails after a, after a limited period of time. So in terms of prediction of the, of the stand-up time, this is a plot showing the time in years from construction of the slope against horizontal movement of the crest. And the predictions were that within about a year or so, the slope will run out of failure. Uh, a section without these intermediate permeable zones will stand, last a bit longer. Sections with higher levels may fail further, but may need a higher level of uh, nailing. So using these calibrated models, we're able to develop a suite of solutions, which are then applied on site, subject to the geological logging for each section. So this just shows, shows design showing in our prediction the expected duration in which the slopes will stand up and the stand up time that was provided from the design, aligned for the fact that often programs are not always 
programs don't, construction programs don't always follow what is planned. So this just shows some examples of the construction, um, showing in the red dotted line the various um, um, levels of excavation depending on the ground conditions. And the little circle on the bottom right hand corner shows a man to give you a scale of the, of the excavation. So using this, there was significant savings over the 1.7 kilometer length, 20% savings in nail quantities, 12 week savings in the uh, installation program, a lot of savings in terms of the uh, lane closure penalty costs or rental costs. And of course, uh, savings compared to an alternative, which might have been a retaining wall um, to support the slopes um, for a very long period of time. Here are some photographs showing the excavation process, excavating down, excavation formation level, constructing the horseshoe section in the bottom left, and then backfilling over the horseshoe, and the whole series of works progressing as a front um, along the alignment. So the conclusions from this were that good understanding of the geology and the ground conditions allowed a lean solution, utilizing the available ground strength um, and accounting for the impact of permeability, which was a key variable. Internal risks were clearly identified beforehand and a flexible solution was selected, even for this high consequence event. And careful monitoring, both of the, of the uh, slope movements water pressures and the geology led to a successful outcome. There are clearly defined responsibilities, who was in charge of logging, how the results were presented, and so on. And uh, this reflects, represents an extension of the um, observational method to use geological and monitoring triggers in combination. I'll now move to two examples which are more problematic. And the first one that I'll start with is construction of the of Metro Line 2 in Warsaw, um, and in particular station C13, which is near the river. Uh, Metro Line 2 was a sort of near 1 billion euro project with 10 kilometers of tunnels and seven stations and shafts. Um, 600 meters of the tunnels were under the river Vistula, which is the main river through the, the, through the city. Um, the contractor was uh, a joint venture of Astadi Gulamek and a company called BDN. And GCG was brought in to assist uh, when problems had uh, occurred to assist with developing solutions. So this is a map showing Warsaw and the, the, um, the section of the line of interest. And the station we're looking at is C13 shown in the circle right next to the river. So the geological section is shown here, the section we are looking at here next to the river. The ground conditions were mid-ground, over quaternary sands, um, and over stiff to hard Pliocene clay. And the Pliocene clay had pockets of silt and fine sands which were connected to the river in this location. This shows a photograph, an aerial photograph of the site. Um, there's an existing motorway running along parallel to the river, which the station had to straddle. The top left-hand picture shows uh, a view of the entrance to that motorway. And so a western and eastern shaft had to be constructed um, and then tunneling carried out underneath the existing motorway. The constraints were that the motorway had to remain operational throughout the construction work which means that investigation of the ground above the tunnels was not feasible beforehand. And this was a key factor in the problems that occurred. Uh, this shows the design that was initially produced. Um, limited ground investigation from the surface either side uh, indicated that tunnels would be in clay and a sprayed concrete uh, tunnel with inner lining uh, was designed to be constructed as three intersecting tubes underneath the existing motorway. Uh, the, 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 this figure on the left shows the ground conditions that were uh, expected uh, with the east and west boxes and the tunnel location within the purple clay. The height of the tunnel was roughly at nine meters 
uh, excavated profile and the length was just under 40 meters from one shaft to the next. So during construction of the shaft, additional um, ground investigation was carried out by drilling from the shaft. And this gave some variation in the clay levels and the levels of the marine of the uh, quaternary sands above, but still essentially the tunnels would remain in clay. And uh, a canopy of jet grouting, protective canopy of jet grouting arch was uh, introduced into the design. So this, this shows a section through the shaft showing the stop tunnel that was started and was being progressed with the jet grouting arch, first installment, and work progressed well until 14th of August. We're close to the end of the first phase of jet grouting before installation of the second phase of jet grouting. When uh, water ingress uh, <coughs> commenced at the crown, and I would like to highlight the, the, time, the sequence of events and the duration of events because that is interesting. So this was noticed around uh, 7, 6 minutes to 12, uh, to midnight, uh, where there was some water ingress from the crown. And over the next 20 or to 30 minutes, they tried to place mock against it to seal the face. And I've got a video here, which I hope will work, showing uh, the ingress from the crown in that area at that time. And you can see some of the mock that was gradually being placed. So the water was trickling in at that time, and uh, I'm just shooting along the video because it's just useful to just show you um, how it is. It's just a close-up. Right. So within, uh, so that was the situation till about almost half past one, uh, till about almost half past one. When within a period of a few minutes, um, there was inrush of material, sand and water, and jet grout columns and other bits, which quickly filled the stop tunnel and then stabilized. All that happened within a few minutes. And then the situation was stable. Um, and what we believe happened was that the boundary for the, between the clay and the sand was lower than uh, expected from all the ground investigation information. And so the cover was breached through or around the uh, canopy of jet grouting. But by about four o'clock in the morning, there was another, uh, so everything was stable from about 1.30 to about four o'clock in the morning when suddenly there was another inrush of material which then filled the shaft, and uh, by the next day, it was flooded pretty much to groundwater level outside the shaft. So the conclusions were that a serious ground risk was missed because of the lack of ground investigation in the critical area below the motorway tunnel, and this proved critical. And remedial measures were then taken to um, uh, restore and complete the tunneling and this involved further extensive ground investigation within the motorway. The motorway had to be closed. A lot of drilling was carried out from within it, within its footprint, to define the, the collapsed ground conditions um, in more detail. Ground freezing, uh, jet grouting, and permeation grouting, and dewatering were all um, measures that were put together to allow stabilizing the station of the collapse and co co construction of the, con uh, the tunnels and completion of the project. The last example I'm going to use to illustrate some more problematic conditions are um, Bosphorus Tunnel Crossing in Istanbul in Turkey. And here we're looking at the construction of Sikerji Station uh, on the European side of the Bosphorus. Um, the bottom right-hand corner shows a key uh, um, showing a, an aerial photograph of this part of Turkey uh, and the location of the project. That's the station of interest. It's around 45 meters deep. And this is a plan showing the alignment of the tunnels. Um, and you can just see the bus cross in the top left-hand corner of that picture. Um, simple alignment with running tunnels, a platform tunnel, central concourse with cross passages, and two access shafts and a ventilation shaft. 
So this is a typical cross section through the middle, platform tunnels and central walkway and cross passages as I've just discussed. The largest excavation for the platform tunnels was around uh, 188 square meters, so quite big excavations. They were constructed in a top heading, two level of benches and inverts uh, using um, excavators. The support measures were 100 to 300 millimeter thick straight concrete lining with rock bolts um, um, in round lengths about one to one and a half meters. And then within this, an inner lining that was typically 450 mil thick was installed, thickening to a meter or so at junctions. This is just a sketch to show the scheme. You have the top heading excavation with initially pi uh, pilot tunnel, um, top heading bench and invert construction all going on at the same time. So the ground conditions are shown here. There's made ground which had a permeability of about 10 to minus 4 to 10 to minus 8 meters per second. And permeability is quite important in this case history, as I will explain. There was marine sands over this, which was also quite permeable, typically 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 6. And below this was the tectonized rock, which was tectonized sandstone or mudstone or claystone, which had a lower permeability, about 10 to minus 8 to 10 to minus 7. Occasionally, there were um, volcanic intrusions uh, along the uh, alignment of the tunnel. You can just make out in green the tunnel alignment and the shafts. It's useful to note uh, the, the, this eastern end where the made ground becomes very thick, almost uh, 15 or 20 meters thick. So the rock itself was hard in parts but had been subject to strong weathering and uh, alter alteration. It was described as uh, having a discontinued spacing of about 10 centimeters or less, so quite frequent discontinued spacing. Some of discontinues ex uh, existing as apertures. The RQD was typically 10% or less, and uh, the contractor was Japanese, so the Japanese rock classification system was used um, based on which the stiffness and the strength of the rock is as given in the slide. G generally, the rock strength was low compared to the loads induced in the ground by the excavation at rock pillars and so on. <coughs> so the problem, the problem was one of settlement. During construction in rock, settlements as high as 150 millimeters were occurring, and this had progressively developed and could not be explained by the contractor, and trigger levels were exceeded and exceeded again and exceeded again. So there was concern about understanding the underlying mechanisms and being sure that um, a safe solution could be obtained to finish the project. This insert figure shows uh, the buildings that were affected by the settlement. So typical building stock is shown in that area, um, post-World War II buildings, typically quite narrow, so vulnerable to shear displacement from ground movements rather than sort of bending deformations that would be more um, uh, dominant to long buildings. Um, the quality of some of the buildings were poor. There was um, building standards were not strictly uh, followed, so there was often uh, reinforcement that was not lapped or not properly anchored or exposed or segregated concrete or voids in concrete. So quality of, of the building was significant, uh, was very variable and in some cases quite poor. A lot of buildings were not, um, did not have building permits, so they were never really um, approved, but had been in use for many decades. So the settlement mechanism. Well, <laughs> this column to the right uh, illustrates the ground conditions I showed earlier. So mid-ground, permeable, marine sands permeable over the rock of lower permeability. Um, the plot shows the piezometric pressure against elevation with the tunnel elevations shown in the bottom left there. So the hydrostatic line uh, shows the um, initial water readings before tunnel construction. The ones circled in red are the ones that were um, installed late. So the initial readings we had are already affected by tunnel, well, potentially affected by tunnel construction. So now the red lines on the same plot show uh, the groundwater movement, the groundwater pressure um, after, during construction of the tunnel. Um, so a drawdown 
uh, is indicated. And inflow into the tunnels was significant, 66 liters per minute per 100 meters of running tunnels. So there's quite a lot of inflow into the ground, creating the drawdown cone uh, indicated here. This is a map showing the wet zones in the tunnel um, uh, taken by the contractor during the works. Um, you can see the tunnel uh, is being enlarged over the pilot tunnel from two ends. And it just shows you how much uh, how much and how widespread the ingress of water was. So tunnel construction uh, and this inflow with, uh, cost drawdown and therefore very significant effective stress increases in the rock. The annual precipitation uh, in this part of Turkey is high, uh, some 800 to 900 millimeters per year. So vertical recharge is large. The horizontal recharge from, uh, in the sand layers is also high, so it's not surprising that construction did not draw down the overburden soils. They are sufficiently recharged. The lower permeability rock, on the other hand, was not recharged as much, and therefore, under drainage, really, by the tunnel itself, was causing a large increase in effective stress in the rock. And, and that was what was causing the settlement. Well, how do, we, how do we know this? Well, close interrogation of the data uh, illustrated it. And here, I'm plotting uh, as time, and I'm going from 2008 to 2010, uh, uh, horizontally, with um, piezometric elevation uh, vertically. And you can see that the overburdening, piezometers in the overburdening soils did not change at all, whereas piezometers in the rock were drawn down during tunnel construction. This is one of the piezometers that was installed late, so we have interpolated what the behavior would have been during, during tunnel construction. So the overburden cells were not underdrawn, the rock was. And so here on the same scale, I've presented settlement and convergence monitoring, and it's a busy slide, so I'll take some time to explain it. It's on the same scale, so you can see the period of tunneling. The higher level plots show the compression of the overburden layers from extensometers. So it's clear that the permeable overburden layers did not compress. They settled, but they settled as a rigid body. The compression was in the rock layers, and this is indicated by surface settlements, which have increased. And you can see really we're talking of about 120 millimeters or so at this stage when excavation was not complete. So the overburden layers were not dewatered, and they settled, and all the settlement, the seat of the settlement was in the zone around the tunnel. So going back to this previous slide, the zone around the tunnel was the zone that was being compressed by this increase in effective stresses, which was probably causing fractures in the rock to close. So looking at it, we could estimate that the settlements from the volume loss of the excavation itself, with a volume loss of about 0.25 to 1%, will give you about 60 millimeters of settlement. The balance of 70 to 80 millimeters was this additional compression from drainage of the rock around the tunnel, giving you a total of about 120 millimeters or so, which was what was observed at that stage. So the conclusions from this were really discounted. We discounted some mechanisms in tunnel erosion. We didn't really see washing in the fines and the layer of, of a bird in between the, uh, the rock cover would probably have generated a self-filtering zone. Um, we didn't have ground failure where the rock was overstressed and was failing. The rock was behaving normally, and therefore volume losses just due to the excavation should not have caused those sort of movements. But with an understanding of the mechanism, it was clear that it was a temporary problem during construction when the rock was being dewatered. Once construction is finished and the inner lining installed and membranes installed, the problem would go away. So there was confidence then to carry on with some modification of the methods of work, improving the face ceiling and using a temporary invert, all this to reduce how much water is flowing into the excavation during the work. Um, installation of some recharge facilities around the tunnel, essentially recycling uh, the water, but trying to keep pressure drop within the rock to the minimum, and then long-term monitoring just to verify that um, there are no uh, blasting issues. So the ground risk of compression of superficial deposits was recognized. The, the, the project was well aware of the overburdening soils compressing and took measures against those, but that wasn't really the problem. 
The problem really was uh, compression of the rock due to groundwater flow, which was not recognized, which uh, led to the large movements and demolition of some buildings um, had to be carried out. The good quality monitoring data was useful. It helped us pick up the problem. I've shown you some of the results that allowed us to identify the zones of movement and therefore the mechanisms. And they allowed a solution to be found even for these mechanisms that were not anticipated at the time of design. So highlighting the benefit of good quality monitoring. So the lessons are uh, careful, exhaustive uh, process of risk identification. Um, Clearly, the benefits of good quality ground investigation and interpretative reporting, um, updating the ground and groundwater modeling, and, and uh, disseminating the information to all relevant parties is quite important. I mean, in Crossrail, the owner made sure that the ground model was available to subcontractors and subcontractors, subcontractors, but quite often they just got one CP borehole near the location and told to design some aspect of the work, and they just don't have the overall picture. The main problem, of course, is uh, uh, unrecognized risks or unwillingness to accept high consequence risks that have a low probability of occurring. Uh, so um, really, there's no shortcut. Rigor with identification of risks and experience uh, the way around it, and there's no app for that. To conclude then, um, it's necessary to follow careful process of risk identification to eliminate risks, mitigate what you cannot eliminate, communicate and transfer what you cannot, and manage risk risks. There's clear be uh, benefit in good quality uh, ground investigation and interpretative reporting to give you a good, good ground model. And there's benefit in disseminating the information to all relevant parties. Main problems are from unrecognized risks, unwillingness to accept high consequence risks that have a low probability of occurring. And this is where experience and rigor um, would uh, assist in, in trying to encompass as best as possible the range of problems that could occur. And uh, a well-designed monitoring system is always very useful, whether to pick up the problems that are anticipated or those that are not, and to inform solutions. And of course, contingency planning, including communication of the risks down the line, right down to the people doing the construction work at the tunnel phase and indicating them are the consequence of these risks is um, uh, always helpful for a successful strategy. Uh, move on with the time and take advantage of new technology. I've given some examples of um, recent monitoring um, and the cartoon just shows how things have moved on since some of the earlier projects. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity. Good evening. Thanks very much, Chris. Can I um, then invite um, any questions for Chris? Um, for those of you, if you'd like to ask a question online, again, if you want to use the hash, hashtag uh, tunnel risk, we'll see if that works to ask any questions. And if I can get the microphone to work, any questions from the room? Let's see if I've managed to arrange it. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you for an absolutely excellent lecture, really fascinating. I think you got there in the end for me, which was the need to have rigour and experience, which, which comes down to the, the training and the competence of the staff on all, on all sides, you know, in the client side, in the contractor's side, in the designer's side. Would you like to comment a bit, a bit more about that in relation to the, the projects that did well and those that did less than well? Yes, I think you're right. Um, experience, of course, allows us to be as exhaustive as we can with identifying the risks, which is a key <coughs> step. Although it's not, of course, foolproof, there are always new situations that you haven't, you know, we haven't been encountered, and that's how we keep learning. I mean, Crossrail, for example, um, there was a, a clear process of, of learning and experience. Um, it started at, at the beginning of the, of the project phase with the ground investigations, where we had uh, GCG representing the client. 
organized uh, logging training courses with Jackie Skipper and uh, Chris King and Rory Mochiba contributed to. That um, informed the team carrying out the ground investigation, but also the drillers were involved in that. So they knew if you found something unusual, you know, it's worth it to highlight it to others, to record and, and, uh, and document the information. That then carried through to the courses being conducted for the uh, designers when they came on board. And so uh, they also uh, 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 took advantage of that. And then there were further courses when the construction team came. So that's just one example of that carrying through. You may also be aware of Crossrail's uh, learning legacy process where Crossrail is trying to collate and make available through its website lessons learned on the project. And that is now being carried through to um, HS2 and B Tunnel. And I think hopefully as we go forward, there will be better and better documentation of, of knowledge and experience. This is just one example uh, to show you. Some of the other projects that um, did not go so well, um, I was not cl that closely involved with the projects until problems came about. So it's difficult to comment. Um, rigorously on the level of training that was uh, undertaken before the problems. Um, but some of the problems, for example, the Turkish one, uh, mechanisms that are difficult to, <laughs> difficult to anticipate, but not necessarily impossible to. So, uh, you know, mistakes will occur from time to time, and sometimes it's a failure of imagination <laughs> that can be the problem. Hope I've reasonably addressed your question. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, the of the uh, twelve thousand four hundred buildings you mentioned, Crossrail surveyed. Uh, ha do you know? Happen to know how many of them needed compensation grouting or um, structural reinforcement? Um, no, I don't, but very little, very, very little. Um, essentially, the strategy that Crossrail took was, I think, as I highlighted, to specify a high-quality TBM, which meant that over most of the alignment with the tunnel boring machine excavation, there was no need, really, to do anything, except perhaps at breakouts or break into shafts. At stations where you had all the complex, large platform tunnels, shallow tunnels, boxes, the settlements then added up to very significant uh, amounts. And it's so locations around the stations where significant um, mitigation action was usually required. At those locations, compensation grouting again was implemented to control them. So I don't have the figures, but it would be a very, very small proportion where perhaps there was some cracking that occurred during the tunneling works, which may or may not be attributed to the tunneling but which the construction team would then have to investigate on a case-by-case -case basis and address. But I don't have firm figures to you, but it would be, if I was guessing, fractions of a percent. Sorry, no, yeah, I have a question. Mm. You mentioned the, the, the fault uh, lines. Uh, the faults uh, <coughs> at uh, Kennedy Wall. Um, we not not necessarily. I, I think again, this is where this builds on your your the earlier question, where experience with interpreting uh, the, the ground investigation becomes important, and having a phased investigation. So, first of all, the quality of logging often picked up either faults or zones that are more disturbed than normal, which often flag up uh, areas of concern, and then additional boreholes may have to be put in. And in the area of firing, then um, the faulting was identified early on. A, a lot of boreholes were put in when there was a, quite a substantial amount of information. Um, then detailed modeling was done. Um, the employer, uh, Crossrail employed the BGS to do a detailed specific monitoring of, of that zone. And then the models were then um, correlated to additional information from construction. Just see how they are how they departed. So yet again, experience both from designing the site investigation, interpreting the results, and using it um, 
have been critical to identifying all that. And even with Crossrail, where the investigation was very exhaustive, there were areas where things were, were not picked up. You know, Bond Street, for example, uh, is an area where some boreholes could not be carried out over the Western Ticket Hall because there was an existing building over there during the ground investigation. And when the building was demolished, the Jubilee Line Tunnel, existing Jubilee Line Tunnels, which was thought to be in London Clay, was in the Lambert Group sands and leaked. So we had, to, we had to deal with the leak, work stopped, and additional investigations were carried out because at that stage the building had been demolished, which showed quite a lot of local faulting and uh, differences in ground conditions from what was thought, even from construction records of the Jubilee Line Tunnel as, as they existed. So you can always do your best, and, uh, and all you can do really is reduce the zone of uncertainty further and further, but probably to be impossible to completely eliminate. Um, for the, the slide that you showed of the settlement around the dewatering of the limo um, shaft, was, yes, was that... Um, was the, the extent of the of the settlement um, in line with what was was designed, or, or was the extent of the the settlement caused by the dewatering larger than expected? It's roughly in line with what was designed, and the difference pattern, I think, reflects several things. Um, to the east of the fault, that area was experiencing dewatering for the first time. To the west of the fault in Isle of Dogs, there's probably been six generations of dewatering going back to the original Jubilee line. So that's, an exp that's, that, that's a component of sort of rebound and, and you know, the sort of, uh, settlement and rebound, which will be less than the initial, initial aspect. Um, there were, uh, yeah, so roughly, generally, as, as expected. Uh, the watering settlements was not really a problem on Crossrail, except, except at one of the DLR uh, junctions where most of the DLR were on piles, and one pier was not because there was an existing dock obstruction, which meant it was sitting on the dock on superficial deposits. And so the potential differential settlement between the different foundations was a potential problem. But even that turned out not to be a problem. The main issue really was that uh, the baseline monitoring was not long enough. And so when additional information was available, it became clear that the environmental movements of that span due to temperature and all that was of the order of magnitude of the trigger levels that was of concern initially. But potentially it could have been more significant. Any final questions? It's a question about uh, the problem in Istanbul, really, and the way that it was identified. Uh, to some extent, uh, to what extent was it that somebody else came in and looked at the problem, identified what the problem were, was, and then verified it from the monitoring data, or was it a question of looking at the monitoring data and then the solution as to what the problem was emerged from looking at the monitoring data? Um, uh, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. Um, it was a design and, it was design and build con uh, contract, and the contractor had people on the ground, but they expected movements of 25 mil, 30 mil. Those movements were quickly exceeded, and explanations were given as to why they were exceeded, and movements increased to about 50 mil. And after three generations of this, and clearly they didn't pick up the right, the right uh, mechanism, we were brought in to help. At the same time, uh, the contractor brought in their specialists who came in to look at, at things uh, in parallel. And I think the, that team that was then brought in together understood the mechanism and, and developed the solution. So it wasn't just done by us coming from the outside on our own, but I guess it was people from outside standing back, looking at the data in detail that allowed it. But of course, having the data there in the first place, installing the instruments, measuring them, presenting the result was a key part to understanding that. And I really have to um, give the contractor uh, uh, that acknowledgement for having done that systematically through the project. If they hadn't installed all the extensive and hadn't monitored, you have five or six rival theories, nobody knows what.